Oh, there we go. All right. Um, so first thing I want to point out, that second link, which is a URL, ho will hopefully eventually contain the slides. So those of you watching the live feed, um, don't get too excited. That link doesn't work yet. Um, and as the title suggests, this talk will be about IP uh, linkability to transactions. Hmm. So that was, there we go. Oops. Um, so the top portion is pretty much what's been implemented today so far, but for chain privacy. Um, the bottom portion is what the focus of this talk will be on, and that is on protecting privacy um, on the source IP of the transaction. So the ones highlighted in red are pretty much what this talk is going to be about. Um, the opportunistic encryption um, is something that will probably also go into Monero eventually, um, but that's just going to take um, some more time to research as well. Um, and because uh, this is Monero, we aren't just doing I2P and Tor, we're also adding white noise and possibly something like Dandelion. It's not going to be Dandelion++, I should give that caveat, um, but there will be some additional mitigations um, for the things that Josh had just talked about with the anybody that can observe multiple points of internet on the on, on the total internet. Um, can uh, Well, we'll just get into that, I guess, as we go through the talk. Okay. So these are sort of the three main threats that we're trying to address. Uh, the first one is probably not as well known as the last two. Um, the first one is anyone that's attempting to make many connections throughout the network in order to infer who is the possible origin. Uh, the next one is probably what most uh, people would think. Um, the ISPs are sort of monitoring your network passively. And the last one is anyone that's able to monitor multiple network uh, points. That also uh, enables even, even more information to be gleaned uh, so, um, again, um, the Danny Lyon paper is probably the best resource on getting information about how this type of attack works. But effectively, you make many connections to the network and you try to learn the network topology through the P2P administration protocol. You know, there's some basic bookkeeping in the protocol on how to, um, you have to spread information about your peers, about peers that you've seen, and this sort of leaks information. Um, also, pretty much every transaction or block brand, uh, block broadcasts will leak information as well because um, you can sort of see how the information is flowing through the network if you have many connections on the network, basically. And it's all statistical based, so it's not guaranteed to work. Um, and that's, and again, see the details on the uh, Dandelion paper. And so to mitigate this, um, Dandelion++ proposal is designed to mitigate against this very specific type of spy. And I2P and Tor would also um, mitigate this issue, but in a very different way. All right, so now the ISP spy, I think the first bullet point most people are probably, is what they would probably guess, the ISP could do some sort of deep pack analysis where they actually process your Monero P2P links and see that, oh, this person um, never received this transaction, but only transmitted it. This would sort of, you know, leak information that you're probably the source of it. Um, so the obvious, um, mitigation of that would be encryption. The difficult part here is we're encrypting something of a very specific size that gets immediately sent to everyone publicly. So these two features are sort of working against each other. And even worse, um, so Moneramu, um, one of the other contributors, added some padding to help mitigate this. Um, um, so it pads up to a next size boundary, hoping to sort of conceal this leakage. Um, the problem is that Monero at its peak had one transaction every 5.6 seconds. Um, so there's a strong correlation between the size of, oh, you know what, I don't know why I'm describing this to you when I can show you. There we go. So this is a Wireshark capture of, this is on mainnet, I don't mess around with, uh, with testnet stuff. Um, uh, this, is, <laughs> this is a single, um, single connection over mainnet. Um, and so the black bars are the total bandwidth and the red bars are the uh, outgoing bandwidth. And so what you'll notice is that there's lots of period of inactivity and short bursts. And so, um, well, there's some awesome GIMP skills, but uh, I don't even have arrows. I couldn't figure that out, honestly. <laughs> Uh, but what you, what you can see is that the, uh, over there to the left, um, there are two block broadcasts that look very similar. And there were no, tran um, there was no transactions downloaded because these are uh, so-called thin blocks or fluffy blocks, I think is what we're calling it. 
Uh, so there's very little transmitted. But again, it looks still looks very it, well. I guess I didn't explain that part. This is actually on a one second granularity, the amount of uh, bandwidth. So if you tighten up the granularity, you can actually, on the far right, it looks very similar, except that this particular peer then downloaded some information for me. Um, and then it, um, just to show you even further, this is a zoomed in portion of the transaction. Oh yeah, I didn't tell you this part. I actually did send a transaction during the Simon Interval too. Uh, so I sent real money over this just for this uh, talk here. Um, so uh, this transaction I sent was about 2.5 kilobits, and you can see roughly from the chart that with overhead of the protocol, you see a spike of exactly that amount going over the link. And you can also see there's other periods of inactivity, and there's also periods of other activity that can't possibly be my transaction due to the different spike levels. Um, now, I don't know if you can see this on, that's probably a little hard to see. One of the interesting things about this connection, I had 34 connections at the time, and I actually received my own transaction from this person before I sent it out, um, which is kind of interesting. You can actually see that in the, in the graph there. That's kind of an interesting, so it is, the Monero protocol apparently is a bit chaotic, and it's very, very, uh, it uses way too much bandwidth, I guess would be the simple way to explain it. Um, um, so now this is the same time period, but all of my incoming, incoming connections, I botched it so I didn't get the outgoing one. I have about uh, 24 incoming connections. And so this is trying to give you the view, if you were running I2P or Tor, this would be kind of what the ISP would see um, they would see similar peaks and valleys. So right away, I mean, you can, you can almost tell immediately, um, I could tell you when I'm running a, a, a command where I'm asking every peer, hey, uh, what, what, are, what, are the, what did the peers that you see? I get a big spike of drama coming back at regular intervals. And you can pick this out even over Tor. It'll, it, you can spot it pretty much immediately. Now, I do want to state that if Tor, Tor does some padding in the cells, so it will look slightly different, but the padding is pretty minimal. And so, again, this is the, the same data points. Um, it will be harder to pick out over Tor, though, because, and I guess I didn't explain that part, I just kind sort of assumed that. The difference between Tor is that all of your connections are going to be going over a limited number of TCP connections. So that's why the graphs will look different. There'll be more noise, so to speak, for the ISP to, to filter through. All right, so as far as the ISP spying goes, um, encrypting data, whether it's um, the P2P links directly R2P and Tor, I would argue it's a partial solution only because you're somewhat relying on luck. Um, if you're able to hide anything, it's because the protocol just happened to ha be sending something at that particular time period that masks what you're doing, um, which is why in my original forum proposal, I propose adding white noise over I2P. Uh, and so now we're talking about the uh, uh, the, our favorite that Josh kept talking about, the global passive adversary. Uh, the problem with this adversary is that they basically can do a better version of the first spy. Um, if they're able to see multiple points of the network, they're not inferring the network topology, they're just seeing the, the network topology. So this is really hard to fend against. And so as an example of something speculative they could try to do, um, even with the white noise, you could try to do the first technique um, where they're making many connections over Tor and then try to de-anonymize Tor users. Now that's, I mean, I don't want to say that that's easy, but it is um, within all the academic literature that is theoretically possible. Um, and so the mitig mitigations, well, that's that Danny Lyon++ plus plus thing uh, that may or may not help somewhat. I mean, honestly, if you really were concerned about that, you'd probably have to go something more similar to a mixed net, but um, we'll get into that. <laughs> Uh, so what is Dandelion++? Plus Plus? Um, hopefully I'll give a quick explanation of that. The idea here is to, uh, well actually they had two goals, especially in the Dandelion++ Plus Plus paper. Uh, they're trying to, I guess I'll just show you everything they're trying to really provide a lot of information there. Um, they're trying to prevent uh, basically metadata leakage about the about the network information. So again, they're trying to prevent against the first type of spy is making many connections. So uh, basically every transaction in the first phase, that's the stem phase, uh, is only sent over one connection. The idea there is it reduces the chance for any of these spies to 
uh, learn about how the transaction is flowing through the network because it reduces the probability that they are receiving the transaction in the first anonymity phase. Um, the second thing is they're choosing outbound connections in the first phase because that, um, I, again, that limits their, them targeting a person where they're making lots of incoming connections to you in order to fill your connection table to really, you know, observe, so that basically you have to send the transaction through them. Um, and then so the idea is after it goes, now mind you, this is within the existing PDP network. So after it, it, it makes through several hops, only selecting outbound peers, eventually there's a, at some point, it gets spread in the normal fashion. By normal, I mean um, Monero can still improve what it does there too. Um, and the other thing I did want to point out, which I didn't think about when I first started this, and this is the last bullet point, which is probably the, one of the more important ones, Dynalion Plus Plus actually makes it easier for the ISPs and these other adversaries. Um, it wasn't obvious at first, but one of the things is the ISP can see which direction the connection is made. So they immediately know if they're following the Dynalion protocol, the, direction, the transactions are only flowing in one way. So the heuristics of filtering out the noise gets even better. And the, the, the chaotic, like, I'm receiving my own transaction before sending it is never going to happen. So it actually makes some of the analysis of the other spies easier, which, um, but for various reasons, where Monero was still probably better at, uh, or not better, uh, better off by implementing it because um, that type of spy is, is probably going to be the most common. But now, ITP and Tor, I think Josh did talk about this already. The main idea of ITP and Tor is just to, to break apart um, who the, the two endpoints of the, trans of the uh, communication channel are. So that's why Monero has always had this in the roadmap because if they use I2P, the idea would be who's ever receiving the transaction wouldn't even know it. So that first type of spy is pretty much completely mitigated because they don't even know the IP of the sender of the other person on the other end. Um, for some of the more advanced uh, people, particularly the, the passive adversaries, they may be able to still infer some information. Okay, now what is white noise? I've been mentioning this a lot. Um, this is mentioned in many places of academic literature, so this isn't anything new. Um, basically, at, inter at regular intervals, send a fixed amount of data. If you have no data to send, you just send, it doesn't really matter what you send, you just send anything because the entire link is encrypted, so anyone observing it doesn't know whether you're sending just dummy data or whether you're sending an actual transaction or part of a transaction. And so, one of the things that is also isn't obvious, and a great paper came out many years ago, is the, the interval needs to be randomized because you can actually detect um, which branch was taken in the code um, based on the timings that come out because the, the intervals won't be exactly precise. They'll be milliseconds off. And someone actually did, the, did a real-world test over uh, several router hops and found this out, that this actually is observable several router hops away. So uh, Monero has, will have you covered there eventually as well, hopefully. So what am I actually saying that uh, will, uh, you know, what are we actually doing in Monero? So the, f the, the first proposal, I think, will be uh, eventually Monero Move, myself, and several others will probably have Denny Lion++ over IPv4 and 6. Um, for, the, uh, for a number of users, they don't even want to run I2P. That will be an option that will at least prevent uh, some some of the more basic type spying that we've been seeing on Bitcoin and these other uh, these other networks. Uh, now, for anybody that wants a little bit more, um, these bullet points are more than probably more of a guidance. I don't think that this is going to be the final solution. The idea is basically, um, I, and I don't really want to call it Dynalion Plus Plus because it's usually taking some of their techniques and making it harder to uh, it create really more plausible deniability on where the origin was coming from. So what I have right now, at least in my working code base, is three kilobytes of noise every 10 to 15 seconds, but only choosing, uh, you know, I have it in there, but only choosing two senders. Um, and so the transactions will either go out to one of two senders, kind of like in Dandelion++, plus plus, and eventually the, um, the receiver over ITP or Tor transfers this uh, into the IPv4 or IPv6 network. The catch is we have to, like, pretty much, I, I'm calling these zones because they pretty much have to be completely isolated to make sure that um, there's no metadata leakage across the zones, including, that's why the first bullet point separate mempools. If 
uh, we commingle the mempool, someone that happens to probe your node about something can then observe that, oh, you've seen this transaction before. How did you know about it? I've never seen it yet, kind of thing. So, um, and this pretty much just highlights, I think, what I've already uh, talked about. One of the interesting things, the reason I started looking at Denny Lion++ plus plus, um, is, well, there's, there's multiple reasons. One of the things is that my original proposal was sending white noise to every peer. This had the very bad downside of a lot of bandwidth usage. Um, or you up the delay interval, but then the transactions take longer to propagate. So uh, by you only using something similar to Dandelion's, the Dandelion uh, protocol, you're using, you're, you're using uh, less connections to send white noise over. Um, the other advantage this has is um, in this mode, anybody that was a global passive adversary, they would be forced to effectively do the first spying technique. They would have to do, make tons of connections over Tor in hopes to de-anonymize users. Um, at that point, they would then have to then try to infer where the transaction came over Tor and, and match it to an endpoint and then de-anonymize that endpoint. Um, and so the plausible, and, and unfortunately, this is kind of really deep within the Danny Lyon++ plus plus paper, but they sort of talk about this trade-off. One of the, the differences between the first Danny Lyon and Danny Lyon++ plus plus was the, the first paper only had one incoming, one outgoing uh, in, an, in the anonymity phase, whereas the, the new uh, one has two incoming and two outgoing for the transactions. The idea there is if someone does learn the network topology, if you only have one incoming route and one outgoing route, it's actually the worst case scenario for statistically. So I may actually propose that basically every outbound Tor connection is white noised over a longer interval. And that will then create, you have a ton of incoming nodes that could be plausible den deniability of which link one of these transactions came over mixed with yours. And it goes to only one of 10. Um, so that will be something that we'll have to probably discuss with the Monero Research Lab. Now, to talk about like all the downsides, which there's a lot. Um, the first one is you really, you get the maximum privacy if you set up a Tor exit node, which, or, or an I2, or the similar concept on I2P, uh, which right now is manual, and that, that's probably not gonna be satisfactory. So, that, and that's, um, there are ways to automate it, um, but yeah, it's gonna take a lot of work. There's also the obvious downsides of all the bandwidth this is using. Um, that's pretty much why Tor doesn't use white noise. Um, now, their cases are different. Um, they're, they're trying to protect Facebook and YouTube traffic for some reason. Um, okay, but the, uh, the amount of white noise you have to do to protect that traffic has got to be just absurdly high. I don't, I don't really know. I never calculated it. Um, the other downside is this has the effect of slowing. Uh, not only does it have the f effect of making the transactions, if you're, tr if you're trying to get a transaction on a timely period, that's just not possible, unfortunately, with this technique. And it also, it drops the throughput because basically you have to wait and have a queue and this creates a, it's the, it's the equivalent effect of having, you can only send transactions at a 3.93 kilobit connection. That's what it's, that's what I'm simulating here in a very, uh, in, a, in, in a very bad way. Um, so the other thing that's kind of unfortunate is these passive adversaries that, adversaries that can multiple, uh, multiple connection points this sort of regular intervals of white noise probably makes it easier for them to, de to develop the connection flow as it traverses the internet. I, I don't see a way around that if you're using any PDP network that, or any TCP connection that's long lived and constantly sending data. I mean, every time you send a data, it's, it's because Tor doesn't have any of these countermeasures, there's statistical information that's being leaked either way. Uh, now I've also, I guess I didn't cover this point. Monero, at least currently in the code base, is only doing transaction broadcasting and a few administration things over, P to, over I, Tor and I2P. Um, if we did the full protocol, you would get more cover traffic, but the downside is there's a bunch of places where we block bad actors and you really can't block incoming Tor transactions because they're just, I mean, it's just some person who created a new public key. I don't know who it is. Um, now, the other downside is it's easier to create uh, more civil cases. So um, if you're worried about black holing, which has been an ongoing discussion in, from the original Dandelion paper, this could possibly make it worse because um, it's easier to create an alias over Torn I2P. You don't need a new IP address, you just need to create a new public key. Um, now this last point, um, 
Oh, um, yeah, well, I don't think we need to cover that because th that's really deep in the details of how it's implemented, and that's going to be an ongoing effort, I think, anyway. So the important thing is probably what is the status of Monero right now? Um, so we've added SOC support, which is probably not, uh, not a lot of people probably know what that is, um, other than the wallet and daemon both have some understanding of an Onion and I2P address, and that's as of this last release that just came out. So if you were to set up a Tor exit node, um, you can have it forward to your daemon, and your wallet can connect to it direct, directly from the wallet over Tor. It connects to a Tor daemon and forwards all the traffic over Tor. You can also, if you knew some cool person that was allowing you to forward your transactions over Tor and they gave you the hidden service, you can do that already now. Um, but again, though, it's, none of this is automated. Um, the white noise is in progress. I have a laptop somewhere that has a lot of that. And uh, actually, it's pretty much done. Um, and one of the advantages is that I, I managed, to get, managed to get some optimizations in there um, as well. So that's, that's a nice benefit. There'll be a partial Dandelion++ um, implementation coming out. By partial, I mean the bits needed so that someone doesn't have to immediately refactor all the code I just did will be in there. Um, and I think the, this proposal, what I'm doing is over to our ITP, will definitely have to change as time goes along because um, uh, there's just a lot of details that need to be worked out. But I think this will be much better than what Monero is doing right now, which is pretty much nothing. So there's that. Uh, and uh, I think that is, yep, that's it. I just got a quick one about the mempools per zone um, idea. Do you see that causing problems with transaction censorship if certain miners are running nodes for ClearNet and for I2P and Tor where they could see transactions between the distinct zones and choose to include only ClearNet or only Tor I2P, et cetera? Yeah, that's, um, so that's what the black calling was referring to. The Dandelion paper discussed that as well. The Dandelion paper actually uh, suggests separate mempools as well. And that's what the reference implementation did. And that is a problem because if you're only sending it to one node for several hops before transmitting it to all, any one of those nodes can just block you. So there is a process, and I didn't discuss that part of the Anyline line plus protocol. That is part of the, uh, there's an embargo timer. So each node who's honestly behaving sets a timer. And if they don't see that transaction come back to them, they, they're supposed to, oops fluff it out. Now, I believe that's how it works. I haven't ever implemented that part at all, so, but it's something along those lines. So that's discussed across, mainly probably in the original paper, but probably in the second one as well. Yep. Um, you showed the traffic graph while you were oh, we connected to Tor. Did no, no, I'm sorry. I, I should clarify. That was not, I was trying to show what it might look like over Tor. So that was, I was still running the same uh, protocol. So the only, the major difference is going to be the um, the incoming and outgoing will be much more confusing, and then the, there'll be padding as well. So it will be much harder to infer anything. Uh, the problem, though, is we've decided, at least temporarily, to only run administration traffic in, in uh, transaction broadcasts over Tor. So there'll be a lot less noise, I think. So we either have to do everything over Tor with the other downsides that we can't really uh, ban block. Uh, we have a block list locally in the node for bad actors over these networks, and there's really no way to do that. So that's, um, I'm sorry. To, so the, I didn't mean to catch you off, but if you had a more question than that. Um, did you do any analysis between the different message padding between I2P and Tor? Oh, no, I haven't done any. No, I see what you're saying. Um, you mean analysis on which one is preferred? Yeah. No, that would be, that would be a very interesting, uh, uh, Work that, that should be done because I don't I don't I don't think I f I feel like less people have looked at I2P. That's usually the knock against it, but it would be interesting because they have an entirely I think what he's referring to here is they have an entirely uh, different design and how they route messages throughout the network. So the, the they use an asymmetric pattern on Tor. The messages come and go over the same links, whereas I2P come over different links. So that has always felt like to me it would be harder to analyze but without actually going through and thinking through all the details. Because you basically have to think through, if I were writing a program to de-anonymize it, what would that look like? And no, I've not done that, sadly. So I don't know anybody that has, but 
if anybody knows. So I've heard um, just kind of anecdotally that the Tor network is significantly larger than the I2P network just oh, from being more popular. That is a good point as well, yes. So I was curious if there's any way to get kind of a at least order of magnitude estimate on the number of nodes in either of the networks so that you can kind of get an idea for what size botnet would be required to make a kind of successful oh. attack against one or, or yeah the, the big thing is the number the amount of people covering your traffic there the amount of plausible dynamability um i don't know anyone that's analyzes two networks i'm sure there's information about that but i don't know it off offhand it's about 50, nodes on ITP and about 7, on oh really Right. Hold on one second. We should probably give that. You should probably give the guy the mic. <laughs> yeah, I was just saying. Um, it's fifty, about fifty thousand in I2P and about seven thousand in Tor. But the major difference is that every user in I2P is also a router. So that's a massive um, difference. And the, the Tor routers are just um, volunteers who set up nodes specifically for that purpose. Right, so that even though Tor has less nodes, it probably has more bandwidth. Correct. Yeah. yeah. And, and I think their model of making everyone a router is much preferred because one of the things now is if you're using Tor, this is probably why the I don't know why the original community originally just selected I2P, but one of the, the problems is that it also makes it even harder if some of your other, you're routing other people's data along with your own. That, that sort of makes things even more complicated. So that's, um, yeah. So I mean, that's why I said at a glance, I, I always thought like I2P was probably better in that regard because of several design choices. But like I said, I've never actually tried to, to think all of them through. Final question? Yeah. Uh oh. <laughs> Another long time and narrow. Uh, what is he going to say? One question that came to my mind is what happens if you set up a full Monero node, but you don't use it for your own transactions, and then instead connect to another node to send your own transactions? So it's, for example, to defeat an IP, your, your ISP spying on you, mm. or at least confuse them in some way. Yeah, because then um, I've, I've thought about similar techniques. One of the other issues I didn't even get to in this talk, I realized I forgot about, there's all kind of side channels where if you're running, if you're running a node here and I'm connecting on my phone back to my node at home, there's going to be a blip of my transaction size over some random SSL connection or whatever, and then it immediately comes back out. So that might work, but there's also the possibility that there's all these other, it depends on how you get it to that user in the other node and how, and how, like, how aggressive that ISP is monitoring it. Because they'll, they'll see a connection, another connection going out of, of a similar size, but it, it's, again, it'd be, a, it wouldn't be an easy correlation, but the correlation is there. But um, yeah. So that is my thoughts on that. Does that answer well enough? Well, yeah. I mean okay. Good. <laughs> <laughs>